fantastic. Shouldn't be legal to be able to sing that good, but you do. Luke chapter 2 is where we're going to be. If you have your Bibles, if you stand with us as we honor the reading of God's Word, Luke chapter 2. Thankful that you're here this morning and um, dealing with the elements <clears throat> as we uh, <clears throat> continue our series um, about Christmas and not missing Christ in Christmas. Now, before I read Luke chapter 2 to you, I want to remind you of a verse. It's one of my favorite verses of all time, uh, but one of my favorite verses in Ephesians chapter 2, it says that for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And then he says these words, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And the question I have this morning, is it possible that you're missing Christ in life Uh, and the things that he has planned for you to walk in because of the busyness of your life. Is it possible that because of distractions, and maybe distractions of the world and distractions of your life, that you are missing what God has prepared for you to do? We're going to look at that through the eyes of Luke chapter 2. And a dude by the name, well, it's not really his name, uh, but an understanding of the innkeeper. We talked about it a few weeks ago. I'm I'm talking about the different participants in the Christmas story. And this morning we're going to talk about the innkeeper. You ready? Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Busy with distractions is the title of this message. The Bible says this. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. And listen, because there was no room for them in the inn. Let's pray. God, I love you. Thank you so much for this morning. God, as we look at all the different participants in the uh, story of your birth, God, I pray that we would be able to learn something from them, that it would challenge us, that it would encourage us, that, God, it would allow us to focus on you so that not only do we not miss you in Christmas, but that we don't miss you in everyday life. Jesus, I'm so thankful that you were born. I'm so thankful that you came. I'm so thankful that you saved us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The old dreaded innkeeper, right? No room in the inn. The old dreaded innkeeper. Now, if you've been a part of the Christmas story at all, uh, and know the Christmas story at all, uh, and been in any or watched any Christmas dramas, which, by the way, next weekend, uh, next Sunday evening, we'll have our children's Christmas drama, the innkeeper gets a pretty bad rap. I mean, everybody knows the innkeeper because he's the guy that's at his place, and Mary and Joseph, this young girl, show up, Uh, who is expecting her child, uh, and they ask to go in, they ask for a place, and the innkeeper's the guy that goes, no, right? And everybody watching it or reading it goes, boo, this mean old bad innkeeper. But the truth of the matter is, is when you read this, it doesn't say one thing about the innkeeper. In fact, we add that. We put that in there. What the Bible says is there's no room in the inn. The Bible doesn't say that the big old bad innkeeper came out and said, no. The Bible doesn't say that the innkeeper had all these excuses. The Bible doesn't say any of that. In fact, in Luke chapter 2, all it says was because there was no room for them in the end. And it allows us in our mindset and in our understanding to begin to look at this understanding of an end where Jesus wasn't accepted, where the birth of Christ was not happening. It was not happening in this end. And this morning, as we begin to look at this, and we begin to unfold and look a little bit more into the story of Christ, and we begin to look at it, the idea as we started this series, I started a Wednesday night ago, as I started this series, was that we would not miss Christ in Christmas, but not just Christmas, but in life. That it might be possible that we're living life and doing our thing, and we miss Him. We miss the opportunities that He has for us. We miss the opportunity to make the right decision, or do the thing that He wants us to, or uh, to use the... 40 or 50 or 80 years that God gives us on this planet to do something fantastic with the life that he's given us. 
Ephesians says that God has, if you know him, he has prepared good things before that you would walk in them. That he has a plan for your life. The Bible says that he orders our steps. But is it possible to miss what God has prepared for you? Is it possible to be so distracted in life that you're not doing what God's called you to do? Is it possible that right now, as you sit, that you're missing Christ in your life? Is it possible that he's been opening doors, that he's been allowing divine uh, uh, appointments, that he has been positioning you for something uh, that is bigger than yourself? Is it possible that God has got his hand on you so much that the things that you fuss about is actually the things that he's using to provide the way for where he wants you to go? Is it possible, as you look at your life this morning, that we would say, honestly, Philip, I think I'm just missing it. And last week we looked at Herod, and Herod missed it out of jealous fear. He was afraid someone was going to take his place um, in a place that he thought was his rightfully, but come to find out he was faking it. He wasn't really king of the Jews. He wasn't even Jewish at all. And then Jesus is born, and he kills all the two-year-olds and younger, all the male boys. And this morning we're going to talk about this inn and the innkeeper. And so what really happened? In reality, y'all ready? y'all ready to learn this morning? Now, I know it's snowy. I know it's kind of snowy, not snowy. It's East Tennessee snow, right? It's here for a minute and gone, right? It's enough to get you out of school, and then it goes away. So, listen, let's all wake up. Let's, let's defrost our brains here, all right? And you're already made the choice to get here, and if we get snowed in or iced in or whatever, Jeff's going to take care of you uh, because I've already had to go pick him up. He doesn't have a vehicle here, so he's going to stay here just like Jesus does the rest of the week. Um, he's just going to be living here, all right? So let's all wake up. We're going to engage. We're going to look at this, and I want you to put you put you think of cabs on and put yourself in the Christmas story for just a moment. I want you to travel with me to this place in the innkeeper and because, because what I want to do is I'll look, look at Luke chapter 2 and I'll tell you the story of three different ends, right? And many times in our, in our studies and in our journeys, we just only look at uh, the one end, the end the here where, that was rejecting Christ, the innkeeper that is here. But the Bible actually speaks of three different ends and I want to take a journey for the next few moments that I have and look at those three different ends. And I want to look at the different stories of those three different ends with the three different results. It's the end that rejected Christ. It's the end that Christ spoke of. And it's the end that, that uh, received Christ or asked Christ to come in. It's all in Luke chapter 2. And so we're going to look at it from a journey uh, through Luke. Now the Bible teaches us that there was no room at the end. But this is something that you need to wrap your mind around. This was not common. This was a very uncommon if you have any understanding of Middle Eastern culture and not the stuff that you just read, read on social media or all that stuff, uh, because some of that is true, uh, a lot of that is true, the barbaric uh, nature, the old uh, way of ruling, you see that uh, often let out in Middle Eastern culture. But there's another side of Middle Eastern culture that you may not understand and that you probably don't realize from this day and time of which Jesus is birthed. Middle Eastern people are very hospitable. In fact, they want to invite people in. That's their nature. Uh, You see it in in travels, and if anybody has ever been there, you're probably going to find that uh, while there are some shady people, it's just like going to Roan County. Most of us are pretty hospitable. There are some shady folks around here. Same way if you go to another country, right? But Middle Eastern folks are very hospitable. They want to invite you in, and most of the time they want to invite you in and ask you to stay a while and eat with them. Uh, we experienced this a lot when we went to Greece uh, and we worked in the refugee camp with folks that were um, uh, trying to uh, leave and flee from Iraq or Afghanistan. And as we walked into the refugee camp, they didn't see a white man and an Iraqi or an American and a Middle Eastern. Each and every one of them, especially the males, would say this, come in, have coffee with me. That is the nature of the folks that we're talking about. So when you begin to look at the story of Jesus Christ and you get to the point where you say there's no room in the end, you should back up go, now something's going on here because that's not the nature of these folks. In fact, when you look at the word in, some people interpret it as the understanding of a hotel, and that's fine in the understanding of 2018 if that makes it work out better for you. But you really need to, and if you think of a hotel, you probably need to put it down like on a Motel 6 or a Super 8 or something like that. I mean, it's, it's lower level, and it's, uh, it could have been uh, by the hour or by the day, right? But more, more than likely, and here's what we understand about these inns, is inns were a place where people could go through, and as they were traveling through, because they weren't hotels, there were certain places where people were welcome to come in and stay overnight. In fact, as you begin to study the ends and you begin to understand what it is, it literally meant guest room. 
It meant guest room. And so all over uh, these particular countries and these particular towns, as people were traveling from town to town, now imagine with me, you with me? Imagine with me, most people were traveling with uh, camels or donkeys or on foot or whatever it might have been, uh, where we might set off and run down to Florida or whatever in a day's time. You might travel six, 700 miles in a day if you want to. Some of you all drive uh, longer than that, and that's okay too if you're crazy. But most of these folks were not traveling those types of journeys because their animals couldn't have held up. They couldn't have done it with all the babies, right? You, you drive Tahoes and Ford Escapes and all that stuff down the road, and you know how hard it is with a kid. Can you imagine strapping that kid on a camel and trying to go down the road? You'd be like, I'm ready to kill somebody. Either the camel or the kid's getting it. Somebody's going down today, right? And so we have these traveling uh, caravans of people that we're going through. And when they would get to a particular town, uh, there would be certain people, and most of the time it was in their home, uh, where you could go, you could rest your animals, they could all feed, they could water up, they could do whatever, you could take all the packs off of them and rest their backs, and then you could go in their home and stay in their guest room, or uh, have dinner with them at their table, and then stay overnight so that you get up the next day and keep moving on. It happened over and over and over. In fact, in some, in some particular towns, they might not have a room uh, upstairs or on the main floor with the family or in their little shack, but what they might have is even underneath their home, they might have a stable where they would put uh, their donkeys or their camels or whatever, uh, or they might have an outside barn where they put their uh, donkeys or their camels. And even in dire situations, they might go there and stay overnight just to be in and out of the elements. You all with me so far? So what we have is, is we have a culture, a culture that is naturally hospitable, that naturally wants to invite people in, and a culture that understands that part of that was not just the culture of how they handle each other, but it was necessary for the way of life and the travel. Those two things exist at the same time when Mary and Joseph are headed for the census to Bethlehem. All right, y'all with me? So here we have her. She's rolling into town. Joseph is leading, and they get there, and the Bible says, now what the Bible says is, is in verse 7, it says she gave birth uh, to uh, her firstborn son, and then the Bible says... There was no room in the inn. The Bible doesn't say she was rejected from the inn. The hotel manager said no vacancy. And then she was forced out into the wilderness and they had this baby alone. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it's different. The Bible says that she uh, had her baby, her firstborn son, wrapped him in cloth. And then, here's what gives it away, laid him in a manger. And everybody, even in the Middle Eastern culture, said, why did they put that baby in a manger? What in the world? Does nobody have a room? And they go, it's funny that you asked, there was no room in the inn. Do you see how we're reading this now? you see how it's understood? And so as we understand this, we begin to get this. This is an absolutely stunning comment. This is one that should be stunning to us, but it's also one that would have been stunning to anybody who had heard the story of the birth of Christ. I want to look at the understanding of when given the opportunity to play a huge role in the story of Christ, how someone running an inn missed it. But I want to I put that side by side with the understanding, is it possible that God's given you a great opportunity to play a role in his story today and you're missing it? Is it possible that Christ has stopped at your inn and you have said, there's no room? Is it possible that at your inn in your life, not the Christmas story, not the manger. Is it possible that currently in your life there's no room? Is it possible that Jesus, the Bible says he stands at the door and knocks. He's knocking. He's wanting to do something. He's wanting to come in and sit and dine with you. He's wanting to bless you. He's wanting to change your life. And you go, not now. I don't have time for this. See, because what really made more sense in the Christmas story is if the innkeeper, or the particular inn that they stopped in, if he'd have gone back in and said, we have to make room, there's one more guest. In fact, she is about to have a baby. There's nobody in this culture that would have just sent a, baby, a woman who was about to have a baby out alone to have her child. They wouldn't have done that. They would have moved furniture around. They would have done whatever they did. But they happened to come to an inn where everyone was distracted. I want to talk about the three inns this morning. The, the inn. Uh, that, that rejected, that had no room for Christ, the end that Christ speaks of, and the end that invited Jesus Christ in. All right, you ready? Here we go. 
I've got uh, a long way to go, short time to get there. All right, so here we go. The inn with no room for Jesus. This is my first understanding of the inns. And the understanding and the question is, is it possible that you're busy with distractions? Is it possible, and you might ask yourself this, as we begin to look and you can see it in your mind, this young boy, this young girl, she's sitting on top of a donkey in your mind, um, and she rolls up, and it's obvious she's about to give birth. And they're trying to get in. They've just stopped. And they said, hey, can we just stop here for the night? Can we come into your guest uh, uh, room? Can we just spend some time here? Just, uh, just, just let us get through uh, these next couple of days. Uh, my wife's about to have a child. And the innkeeper says, I'm sorry, man. We just really, we don't have any room. We wish you the best. We, we, we don't have any. There's, there's a barn down the road that you're more than welcome to stay in. But, but we don't have any room here in the guest room. Is it possible that you... Just like this innkeeper was distracted by your life. The Bible says, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. And I want you to see this, and I want you to see how it's written. And I want you to see more than the fact that there's no room. I want you to see the fact that had there, as we reverse this, had there been room, watch. Had there been room in the end, can you imagine how many more players there would have been in the story of Jesus Christ? If you understand that there had been room, then Mary and Joseph would have been able to go into this inn. They would have been able to have a room. She would have had a, 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 a midwife. She would have had someone to help her with the baby. She would not have been alone in, in a barn, per se, or a cave giving birth on her own. She wouldn't have been in there uh, bringing forth the king of kings with just her husband, who was just a guy and ladies. Can you imagine? Can you imagine having to go into birth with just your husband at home? You say, well, he probably could have done That dude can't even find the ketchup in the refrigerator. Are you talking, to, you talking about the same guy? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what Mary must have been experiencing? Can you imagine? I mean, it's the perfect ending to the most a crazy story in all the world. This young lady that's about to be married to her husband that she loves, they're betrothed. The Bible says they're engaged. Then the Bible says that the Holy Spirit spoke to her and tells her that she is carrying the Son of God. Then the Bible says that Joseph finds out and he is making plans to divorce her quietly. And as I shared a few weeks ago, the reason is, is because he was a good man. He really loved this girl. But it even, the story doesn't even make sense to Joseph. Joseph's going, my wife's going to have a kid and she's trying to tell me it's God's baby. I mean, that's the perfect Christian answer, right? Blame it on God. Are you trying to tell me I've not been with anybody? Sure, yes, a positive. But then where did this baby come from? Jesus? You know, I mean, no, no, it doesn't work. And they're having this, this thing, and he's going, man, you're, you know, I don't know that I believe you, but I love you too much to tell everybody why I'm divorcing you because they will kill you because they're going to think you've been unfaithful, and they're going to kill you. So what I'm going to do is privately, I'm going to divorce you, or I'm going to break off the bet bet betrothing, and I'm going to get rid of you. And then the Bible says an angel comes to him and says, listen. Don't you give up on that girl and you take her as your wife because my son is in the, in the belly of your soon-to-be wife. Is that the way he said it? No, but that's the way I said it. And you can imagine Joseph waking up and going, oh. You can imagine Joseph as his wife's belly's growing and they're not married yet trying to explain, explain to his buddies that he's not been with his wife. Yeah. See, in our culture, this is very forbidden. In their culture, something's up. They've already been abused mentally, verbally. They've already got the eyes looking at them. They have already have been bonded in such a close relationship because literally they have nobody but themselves. You don't hear about the mother of Mary. You don't hear about the mother of Joseph riding with the son and daughter-in-law and trying to take care. You don't hear any of that. What you hear about is Mary and Joseph going to Bethlehem for the census. And what I would imagine is they were the outcasts. And I would imagine that anybody and everybody heard the story of this child that was coming laughed. And maybe when they pulled up at the end, they looked young and the story didn't pan out. I don't know why this innkeeper... Uh, technically told them no, but he had no room. And now they are forced into a barn or a cave. People can't decide whether it was a barn or a cave. doesn't really matter. Would you rather have a baby in a barn or a cave? I mean, if it's reduced down to a barn or a cave and not Park West or Tanova, you're out of luck. You know, okay, so it doesn't really matter. 
And there they are, this 13-ish age girl, about to have one of the most incredible moments in all of her life. Every single one of you ladies would say that the birth of your child was one of the greatest days of your life. And she's alone. She's alone. And the only person she has to depend on is her husband, Joseph. He's a young guy, too. And they're in this barn, cave, makeshift hospital. All because some dude was so distracted with his life that he couldn't make room for Jesus. Now, let's talk about this for just a second. All right, we're going to leave them in the cave in the barn. There they are. Let's come back to this innkeeper. Do you know how close this dude was to absolute phenomenal glory? Do you know how close he was to being the guy going, You're not going to believe who was born in my house. I delivered King Jesus. (laughs) I know his mama. I know his daddy. We got a relationship. What would you do? I just said, come in. I didn't know she was that close, but she was close, man. She came in. Boom, baby born. This guy has no clue. In fact, When you continue to read, you know what you don't hear about? The innkeeper. Nothing. You don't hear about him. You don't hear his name. You don't say, well, the innkeeper went on to have a great innkeeping life. He bought more rental properties. And he was just an innkeeping genius. And that's how we got Howard Johnson. That's not what you hear. In fact, you don't hear anything about him. In fact, wouldn't you imagine that if he has an inn and it was full and there was no room, that there were other people there? Wouldn't you imagine that there's probably some ladies in there, probably some moms? There was probably some people in that inn that needed or could have cared for Mary. There was probably some grandma-aged ladies and some young ladies that were there that could have said, you come on in here, ma'am, and we're going to take care of you, and you get us a basin of water, and you get us a towel, and you get us some rags, and Joseph, you and Bill and Larry, y'all get out of here. We're going to take care of her, and we will let you know how it goes. There were some women in there that could have really taken care of Mary, and you know what their story would have been? Hey, let me tell you about the time that King Jesus was born in this hotel I was staying at. We were just there at the same time, man. This guy doesn't understand that when he says no and closes the door, he has no idea how many lives he impacted. No clue. He said, Phil, why are you talking about this? Because I want you to understand something. When you miss Christ, it's not just you that misses out. It's all those people around you that miss out as well. That there's some of us within the sound of my voice this morning. Dad, listen to me. Dad, listen, listen to me, Dad. Dad, there's some of you are here this morning, some of you dads that are here, listen on the internet, listen to me. You are missing Christ in your life. Listen to me. You may not think it's a big deal for you to miss Christ because you grew up and you don't like hypocrites and you don't like going to church and you don't like me, you don't like whatever, but I'm telling you something. There's little boys and little girls coming up and underneath you and they are missing Jesus Christ because you have shut the door of the end of your life and it's going to have a ripple effect for for eternity. There's some women in here that you're missing Christ in your life. And you're caught up in this and you're caught up in that. And God has given you those precious eyes that are looking to you, Mom. If you just welcome him in, do you know how many stories go like this? As you look at faithful men and women, followers of Jesus Christ, they'll say this. It was my mother who never stopped praying, who hung in there with me, who fought with me and fought for me. This is why this is such an important message. This is why we can't miss Christ. Is it possible that we're here and we've shut the door on Christ in our life? There's no room. Like, see, you hear these messages week after week. You hear all these things and and people walk out and go, man, that was a great message. Or I like that message. Or I didn't like that message. Or he was missing it today or whatever. And you walk out of here. But the truth of the matter is you're shutting the door on the end of your life. And God has a plan for you. That where you are now is not where you're going to end up if you would just invite him in. See, the first room that we need to look at is the end with no room for Jesus. It's kind of interesting because the innkeeper who rejected him would have known certain things. 
the greatest thing that he would have known. Remember, he's Old Testament guys, right? We're living in the New Testament now. Jesus is the capstone to the New Testament. He starts the New Testament. He's the new covenant, right? There's a new covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus starts the New Testament. This dude would have been living out of the Old Testament understanding. This guy that shut the door would have known certain things. He would have known about Abraham and Sarah and the time that the stranger showed up at their home and said, you're going to have a baby, and they laughed. And they would have talked about that and said, you better be careful because you entertain angels sometimes that you think are strangers. You need to listen to them. Now here they are. The strangers are sitting on their front porch. And this man had enough spiritual knowledge and religion knowledge to not close that door. He would have been very familiar with Exodus and with uh, Moses and the understanding of treating others as you would want to be treated and loving your neighbor as yourself. He would have known those kind of understandings. And here he is looking into the eyes of someone that needed something and with all of his religion knowledge, with all of his back Old Testament knowledge, he shuts the door. You say, well, I think you're making more of this than you should. Uh, Am I? Maybe I am. You're right. You're right. Maybe I am. But they did put it in the Bible. They wanted us to know. They could have just said he was born and placed in a manger and just let the whole inn out. We could have just said, well, they just didn't make it to an inn. God wants us to know something. God wants us to see something. You say, Philip, why would you mention it that way? Because... The same way this innkeeper in his moment when he has Christ, literally, (laughs) Jesus Christ is standing on his front porch in the belly of Mary, sure. He's on the front porch. This guy, I don't know if he just kind of slid the thing and said, no room. (laughs) I doubt it. I don't know if it was raining. I don't know if it was sunny. I don't know if it was dark. I don't know if it was windy. I don't know what it was. But here's what I do know is this guy is living his life. He happens to have an inn in a very busy time of the year when everybody is going up to have the census taken. There's people running around everywhere. He is booked solid because people are coming into town, traveling through, back and forth. He's running around. He's distracted by all these people. And it's quite possible that Joseph rolls up. And you don't know when he did. You don't know what time it was. But it's quite possible Joseph rolled up, had the donkey, Mary sitting on it, got a baby and the innkeeper just goes hey dude I'm sorry I don't have any other place and he goes but my wife's about to give birth and he goes I really hate that uh, but there's a stable right down there there's a cave right down there you're more than welcome to use it I don't have anywhere to put you he doesn't even talk he didn't ask any questions he doesn't do anything because his mind is other places with all the other guests that he has to take care of you said Phil why would you say it that way because that's how we treat Jesus Christ most of the time in our life we come in here and we got a lot going on And can I tell y'all something? I want you to listen to me. I'm assuming that you like me if you're here. If you don't like me and you're here, you got real issues. But I'm assuming that that's why you come. And you like people here and you don't mind the messages. I'm assuming. Can I tell you something? I don't prepare multiple messages every week just so I can get up here and show off how well I can speak. I don't prepare every week so I can get up here and tell you the stories from the Bible that you already know. I got other things to do. If you want that, we can do that. We'll go to lunch. I'll tell you all the stories you want to know. I'm a good storyteller. I'll even make some up. But here's the deal. You're here this morning because God called me as a preacher of the gospel. I'm here this morning to preach the gospel that he called me to preach. And he's here this morning to take the gospel that is preached to minister to your heart. Now listen to what I'm about to tell you. Many of us come in here week after week after week. And God is standing on the front porch of our life asking to come in. And we all agree it's a great word. We all have the biblical knowledge to know how we should treat the Holy Spirit. But we slam the door shut because we're busy with other stuff. I ain't got time for this right now. I don't have time to get involved in that. I don't have time to do that. They just better be thankful. I'm here this morning. It was hard enough to get here this morning. Don't they know we came through the snow? I'm, I'm not making fun. I make fun at 11 o'clock. They all won't be here, and you will. But it's what we do each and every day. There was no room. So why? Are you ready? Why was there no room for Jesus? I'm going to tell you why there was no room for Jesus, give you some practical understanding to it, and then we're going to move on to our last two. Why? Distractions, busyness, two different words, 
two understandings, same result. Listen, some of us in here are busy with distractions. You're busy with life. You're just busy in general. You're distracted. You ever get distracted? You ever get distracted at work? Sometimes people will be trying to talk to me and I'll get distracted. You ever, you ever talking to somebody and somebody get a text and they're answering their text while you're talking? They go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And you're like, would you just look at me? They get distracted. You ever get out on the road and you see a distracted driver? Right? I do that sometimes. i got to watch myself because sometimes I'll be driving and I'll see something that I want to look at and I'll look over here and try to keep driving and I'll take my eyes off the road and I'll be all over the place. It happens quite often, right? You can get distracted. You can be distracted in marriage. You can be distracted at work. You can be distracted with your children. You can be distracted all over. What's wrong with this innkeeper? He was distracted. He was not focused enough to realize in this moment, Jesus Christ, after waiting years and years and years, after God being silent for over 400 years, this guy is the guy that Jesus shows up to to be born in his home. Of all the people. Of all the people. This is the guy. This is the home. This is the end. These are the people that are all inside. And Jesus goes, this is where I'm going to be born. This is where God goes, this is where my son's going to be born. And he gets there, and the people go, no room. Try the barn. See, Ephesians says that God has prepared good works beforehand that we would walk in. That it's possible that God has prepared things in your life that you would walk in that you're missing. That he literally is bringing Jesus Christ and his will and his purpose to your front doorstep. And you are going, not now. I can't. I'm upset. I'm dealing with something. He was distracted. We miss playing a role in the story of what Jesus is doing because we're distracted. So how do we get distracted? Here, I'm going to share with you sometime. Are y'all taking notes? Good, I'm glad. All right. <laughs> I've been on my reglow. I can't see nothing. I just assume everybody's writing and going like this. I can't see nothing. All right, good. So how do we become distracted? Y'all ready? Y'all ready to, to look at this? I want you to look at this. This is a very, uh, listen, if you haven't been taking notes, you need to take the notes on this right here because now I'm going to move from this story and just start looking at us in a very practical understanding. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. You might want to write this down. The greatest thing that will keep you from doing what God wants you to do in your life is distractions. L- let me take it a step further. Most people end up having major issues in their life not over the issue that they're dealing with but over a distraction before the issue. So I don't know what that means. It means this, that you could jump me this morning because you're frustrated because the parking lot was not scraped by a snow plow truck thing. um, And you came in with slush on your shoes and somebody's going to fall out there, preacher. And we're going to be sued. And you're going to lose your job. And I don't pay my tithes so I can walk across slush. What kind of church you running? Now, y'all may think that's crazy, but I guarantee you somebody this morning, some preacher's getting that word. You say, no, you ain't been in church long enough, I'm just telling you. It happens all the time. That's why I hide out. I can see you coming to, I look at your shoes first. Bless you, okay, got to go, Brad. And you know what I found? Is that guy ain't fussing at me over no no slush. He's not fussing at me because it's snowing. He ain't fussing at me because there's no snow plow outside. You know what he's fussing at me about? It's because he can't fuss at the person he's really mad about, something else. And he's going to take it out on me. He's going to take it out on anybody. This is what I call kicking the dog. He said, when you get mad at work and you go home and old Buster's there ready to meet you and lick your leg and jump in your arms and you go kicking the dog. You want that dog dead? Nothing. And you know what you're doing is you're taking your frustrations out on that dog You're taking your frustrations out on your wife. You're taking your frustrations out on me. You're taking your frustration out on your employees or your employer. You're taking your frustration. And normally, if we drill into that hard enough, this is why some people don't like to sit down and talk. If we drill into that that long enough, and if we really get down in there, here's what we could agree. You're not really mad about that anyways, are you? No, not really. So what are you frustrated about? And here's what will happen. Boom! All this other stuff begins to fall out. And you got to watch it because distractions will come upon you. So how do you become distracted? What are those things made up of? Number one is self. We become distracted from doing what God wants us to do or allowing him into the end of our life, the guest home of our life. 
We, we become distracted with self. We are so focused on self that we miss out on the things around us. You're just focused on you. Can I, can, I be, can I be sensitive and at the same time point a finger at you for just a second? And I only do that because there's uh, three others pointing back at me. Right? We are so self-centered. We are so self-focused. We, we, we are focused. I'm not talking about you and your wife or you and your children. I'm talking about you, pal. Just you. We are so self-focused. We're focused on how happy we are in our marriage or how happy we're not in our marriage or how happy we're at work or how happy we're not at work, how this worked out for us. And can I tell you what happened to me? Can I tell you this? We have created this so self-indulgent culture that everybody is focused on self. You start to look at all the fussing and the fighting and the political correctness and the bigotry and all this other stuff going back and forth. What does it come back to? It comes back to selfishness. We have created a culture where it's all about me, 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 and we bought into it. And I can tell you, most of the time, I get frustrated because I, myself, ain't happy. And when myself ain't happy, myself fights for myself. And so I get distracted in it. I feel like I've been uh, taken advantage of at work, or I feel like I've been bypassed, or I feel like she don't love me enough, or they don't meet my needs, or they don't do this. And it's about me, 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 me. And those kids are driving me crazy. I mean, I love them all, but God gave them to me, and I like to kill them all, but I go to jail, so I ain't doing that. And so I'm just frustrated. How I haven't, you know, all this stuff, we just start me, 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 and we become distracted. And God shows up and says, hey, I'd like to talk to you about something I like doing in your life. And you go, I ain't got time for this. You know what's going on in my life? I'm dealing with so much stuff. And you are. But you can't let yourself become the distraction from what God's trying to do in your life. And you realize that the only reason you're here is because God allowed you anyways. That the breath in your lungs is a gift from God. That some of us, if we would look at our spouse or our children and say, listen, I just, I just want to tell you this. I'm sorry. And they're going to say, what are, you mad for? what are you sorry for, Dad? What are you, what are you sorry for, honey? What are you sorry for? I'm sorry that I've been so self-focused that I have become a distraction in this home. Right? Maybe at work. Maybe with your friends. Right? So we become distracted by self. Number two is this. We become distracted by others. Boy, that sounds funny, don't it? You can become distracted by self. You can also become distracted by others. Now, uh, we become... So involved with others. Now listen to me. This is going to sound counterintuitive to what I'm about to say in just a few moments. But truly, listen to what I'm about to tell you. Other people will cause you to be distracted. Other people's drama. Other people's pain. Other people's lives. Other people's issues. We use words like codependency in what I do. There are people who become so distracted because they are so codependent on somebody else. That they can't enjoy the life that God's given them or do what God's called them to do. We get so caught up in all this other kind of stuff that we want to save the world. You know what? one of the things I have to fight? I really have to fight it and I have to have people that have to help me with this. Is I have to be real careful because what you may not know about me is I want to save everybody. Like literally save them all. I want to help them. I want to bail them out. I want to do all this stuff. And you know what happens to me is if I'm not real careful. I had somebody stop me the other day. We were, we were meeting and we had dinner together. And I was talking to her and her husband. And when we walked out of the restaurant, here's what they said to me. They said, um, thank you for making time to meet with us tonight. And it was really great, blah, 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 whatever. Um, but who do you talk to? And I said, that ain't none of your business. <laughs> It was something I had to learn because they were pointing out and understanding. They, they kind of got it before you know, somebody had to tell them. But if you're not careful, when you begin to take on the burdens of everybody else, their burdens will now become your burdens, and you will become distracted from God, what God's trying to do in your life by the pain or the drama of somebody else. People get in our ears all the time. You have to be real careful. Here's what I, we talk about, and I don't have time for this this morning. I'm going to keep moving. But healthy boundaries. You've got to have healthy boundaries. It's okay to say, that's far enough, or I've done all I can. And they may pop up and say and do and all this stuff, but you have to have healthy boundaries. Because if you don't have healthy boundaries, this is what's going to happen. That person that's sideways or out of control, that you're trying to save, all the mud that they're slinging, trying to get out of the ditch that they're in, they're going to suck you right down the same ditch, and you're going to be just as muddy as the person you're trying to pull out. And now both of you are in the ditch, and both of your lives are out of control. Does that make sense? 
And so we have to be careful with that. And now a lot of times, listen to me, we will get to that point where we're frustrated, we're hurting, we're pain, we're whatever because of other people that we're trying to help. And God shows up and says, hey, I want to talk to you. And you go, I ain't got time for that right now. Don't you know what's going on with Martha? Don't you know what's going on with my children? Don't you know what's going on in this attic? Don't you know? And we just absolutely just lay our lives down when Jesus Christ is saying, I want to do something in your life. I ain't got time. Number three, we become dis, uh, distracted by death, divorce, or disinterest. I just put all three of those together. I've preached on that before. But it's very easy when you face a major, major loss in your life to become distracted. There are people who get to the graveyard and they never leave it. And God shows up and wants to heal them, wants to work in their life, take them on a new journey, and they close the door. They don't have time to invite him in. Divorce is another big one. We have people, and I've seen this over and over in church life, people that are involved, involved, involved. Their kids are involved, involved, involved. Something happens between mom and dad. They end up going through a divorce, and you never see either one of them ever again. We've got it right now. They never see either one of them ever again. And well, what happened? Well, the pain that you were struggling with, go back to number two, others, has now impacted you to the point that it has become pain for you. Go back to number one, self. And now what's happened is the enemy has used yourself and others and the pain and drama of all that to pull you away from the grace and the knowledge and the mercy and the new beginning in Jesus Christ. And so the enemy will use all this to make us distracted. And listen to me. Here's the fear. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. When you become distracted, listen to what I'm about to tell you. You may not think this, but I'm telling you from experience, it is true. The longer you stay distracted, the longer it takes for you to come back, if you come back to the way of Christ in your life. Disinterest. Maybe you're going through life and you don't feel like anybody cares. Number four, we become distracted by personal conflict, relational conflict. People start having troubles at home, whether with their children or whether with their spouse. They become very distracted, very, because it is so personal and it is so relevant. It is day and night, night and day. It's a distraction. And it's people that you love that are close to you. So what happens to you is all of that emotional energy that's being spent on that leaves your tank empty when you're doing everything else and you don't feel like it or you don't like it or you're hard to get along with or you're holding grudges against people or you're kicking the dog when you get somewhere else because of what's going on back there. And Jesus shows up and says, hey, listen, I've got something. Jesus, I can't deal with that right now. Do you know how my wife's acting? <laughs> Jesus shows up and says, hey, I, I want to do something. You know, Jesus, I appreciate it, but do you know what's going on with my son? I deal with more people with number four issues that get acted out in everyday issues. If you just took time to talk to them, you'd realize that what they're frustrated with or what they're hung up on or why they stopped has nothing to do with you, me, or church, or Jesus. It has everything to do with some kind of conflict that they're facing internally. Number five is sin. Sin will get you distracted, won't it? No? Okay. That's a good time to say amen. All right. Thank you, choir. I appreciate that. Sin will distract you, man. You start harboring sin in your life, you start having secret sins, you start having all that stuff, it will absolutely distract you. It will cut off any kind of communication that you have with Jesus Christ. It will leave you embarrassed, it will leave you, leave you lying, it will leave you uh, running from what it is that God wants in your life. And then God shows up on a Sunday morning and says, hey, we need to talk. And you go, there's no room. Click. Number six is busyness. Busyness. <clears throat> we, can I say this up openly? We are one busy generation. One busy generation. Uh, last night I was, I don't know what I was doing, but the Heartland series was on at my house. And it was from, I guess, the late 80s, early 90s, I guess. And they were out in Boone, North Carolina, talking to an old timer that was telling funny stories on his front porch. An old wooden log cabin, there he sat. And, oh, what's his name? I don't even remember his name. He was interviewing him. And I was looking and I thought, my goodness, in the past 15, 20 years, how life has changed. Where you used to be able to pull up a seat and sit down and just talk to somebody for a little bit. Spend some time with somebody. We don't have time. If I went around this room right now, everybody in here would say, I don't have time. I'm busy. I'm busy. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Busyness will become a distraction from what God wants to do in your life. 
Listen to me very carefully. You need to get this one. All those other ones are really good, and we can sit down and we can go through them. But I'm telling you right now, if there's any of these off this list, I'd pick six every time to talk about because six is where most of us are. Most of us are. Jesus Christ is wanting to do something spectacular in your life, and the only thing keeping you from experiencing it is the busyness of your schedule. Most people in here, I don't know. I'll see if I have time. I don't know. We run from daylight to dark most each and every day. And busyness, listen to me, you need to write this down. Busyness does not translate into spiritual success. Just because you're busy does not mean you're spiritually successful. In fact, I would argue that the enemy takes some of the most spiritually successful people and gets them busy with life to get them distracted from what God has called them to do. And so while we may say, well, you only live once, you only get to do this, listen to me, that may be true, but you're going to only live once, and you're going to run around like the Tasmanian devil, you're going to get to the end and did a whole lot of nothing. But you did a lot of it. What have you been doing? <gasps> I don't know. Whose life was impacted? I don't know. And busyness takes over. Busyness is destroying marriages. Busyness is destroying families. Busyness, busyness is destroying churches. Busyness is destroying you and me. And ultimately, busyness is keeping us, when Jesus shows up, from having the understanding. Remember, he had all the religion knowledge. He had all the understanding. Here's all he had to do was go, oh, come in. And you know what? We're so busy that we run to church and then leave church. And i got to get to lunch. And then i got to get over here. And i got to deliver that. And then I'm going to get home. And they've got practice. And I'm going to get them for practice. And then we got to do homework. And somebody's got to give them baths. And then we're going to go to bed. And it's been such a fantastic day that we don't even know who we are. We haven't even spoken. But let's do it again tomorrow. Yay! And Monday's the same. And Tuesday's the same. And Wednesday's the same. And we pass each other. In the hallways, running to the next fire, being busy. Someone somewhere taught us that if you're moving fast in any general direction, you're successful. And I would argue it'd be better moving slow in Jesus' direction than moving fast in the wrong direction. Because if you're moving in Jesus' direction, you're going to be successful. But if you're moving fast in the wrong direction, you're just going to pass yourself and waste your life. What leads to busy? Well, I'm not even going to get close to being done with this. I've got two more ends. And I, well, I'll just finish it next week. But I'm going to talk for my next few minutes. All right? I think this is important. I put this in here because this is so important. I could have moved on to point number two right now, but I don't want to because I want you to get this. All right, Most of you guys are raising families or successful at work you need to hear me what I'm what I'm telling you listen to me the innkeeper was may have been distracted by one through five maybe but he was ultimately distracted by number six number six he was busy remember remember it was the census remember there were people everywhere remember people were coming in remember he was so busy and people milling around and it was a crazy time that he could not focus on the fact that Jesus was standing on his front porch so he turns him away. He misses out on the opportunity to host in the birth of Jesus Christ. He misses out on the opportunity allowing others to come into contact with Jesus Christ. All because he's busy. So what leads to the distraction of busyness? Are you ready? Number one, write these down. Please write these down. Too many priorities. Too many priorities. You got too many priorities, man. You know, one of the things, if you join a Grove, you know what we do? Is we reduce, reduce joining the Grove and being a Grove member to four things. All we're going to ask you to do is to be four things at the Grove. Remember what people say all the time when they come to the church? 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work. And they beat the church up over that. And I've always kind of found it kind of comical because if you go in any home, here's what a mom would say. The mom's doing 80% of the work. Right? It's pretty standard. This is what happens. Now, some of you dads going, you don't know my house. I do all of it. Okay, whatever. But, but that's what happens. So what we did here at the Grove is we tried to reduce it so that you wouldn't come to the Grove and feel like we were working you to death. Now, some people still get worked to death because they choose to, but we try not to. And I try to 
break that up as much as I can, but it still happens from time to time. But you know what we did? All we did was we said, this is what we want you to do. There's four priorities to joining the Grove, and it's real simple. In order to be an effective church member and to be an effective Christian, what we feel like is is that you need to come to morning worship, come to corporate worship. There's something that happens when we're all together. Come to that. Find a small group and get plugged into it because you need to go take what you're learning here and go deeper. And I don't care whether it's on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, whatever, but you need to find that small group, right? And then the number, the third thing is you need to find a place to serve. God didn't come, that didn't bring you here so that you could sit here and soak it up. He came, He brought you here not only so that you could soak it up, but then you could give it away. Those are the three th- things that we've asked you to do. Pretty easy if you ask me. We want you to come and worship with us. We want you to get plugged into a small group. And number three is we're wanting you to um, use your gifts that God gave you when he brought you here. But number four, here's the fourth side, was to give. Help us continue the vision of what God's called us to do by giving, by being a, a faithful giver, right? Those are the four things. That's all we're asking you to do. I didn't ask you to be at every event. I didn't ask you to be at every meeting. I don't take that stuff personal because sometimes you can't do it. But here's what happens is we set Christians up for failure when we put about 10 or 15 requirements on them for them to be successful, right? Nobody can ever stand underneath that understanding. But everybody can go to church on Sunday or, or find a small group or give their talent away and give their finances away. That's easy. But you know what we do is we take that mentality. We'll beat the church up over it because they're working us to death. They're working me to death. They expect me to come to church twice a month. I mean, they're working me to death. Jesus, you need to send a real preacher down here. He's just too hard on us. Son, let me tell you something. I grew up, you were at church at least three times a week, if not four if we had visitation. And if you missed one, one of those a month, one, they would take your name off the roll. You'd have to rejoin the church and be rebaptized. Just tell them how serious you were to get back in. Some of y'all, y'all come to church once every three months, and I'll see you and go, that's my preacher. I go, I ain't seen you in months. Good. We good. You say, Phil, why do you say that? I'm not talking about church this morning, but here's what I am saying. Is we have created too many priorities. In life, forget church, let's get in your home. You're trying to do everything. Well, I just want my kids to have a life I never had. That's fine. That's, that's perfectly fine. On the back side of that, I'm seeing the kids that we're raising, and they never, listen, listen. You know what they're interested in? That you love them. Love them. All that other stuff comes and goes. I'm not saying don't do it. I provide for my kids, and I give them every opportunity I can. But you know what we try to do? Here's what we try to do, and we fail at it. We try to find priorities. And there's times that my kids stand in the hallway, and they go, but dad, but dad. And I go, no, we're not doing it. But dad, we're staying at home today. But dad, it's a once in a lifetime. If you're peeking out at age 14, it's going to be a long rest of your life, son. That's all I'm telling you, right? Too many priorities. You need to ask yourself this question when you look at your life. What really matters? What really matters? Number two is this. You try to fit it all in. There are things you can and you have to say no to. There are things you have to say no to. Listen to me. If you're ever going to stop long enough for God to use you, I mean, I mean, really, guys, really, when we get to heaven... And God goes, listen, I told you that I prepared good works for you to do. I prepared them beforehand that you would walk in them. Can I ask you a question? Why didn't you do this and why didn't you do that? It was there. And you go, oh, yeah, I remember that. But I think we were busy. We were trying. Oh, kids had ball. That's what it was. Um, you know, they were just working me a lot. I mean, somebody's got to pay the bills. You know what Jesus is going to say? Have you lost your mind? Have you lost your ever-loving mind? Did you not know that the busyness that you were doing to try to produce a future for your own, all it did was wear you down and you never really got to where you were supposed to go. But had you stopped one time and said, I know I have all these other things that I want to do. This is the thing that I'm choosing to do. Had you stepped through that door and let me in off the front porch, I was going to open up to you a future that you and your children could have never dreamed of. So we try to fit it all in. Let me tell you a byproduct of fitting it all in. We've, we've created this culture to where we split the family up. And some of y'all ain't going to like this and you ain't going to want to come back. It won't be y'all, it'll be 11 o'clock. Y'all came in the, you came in the snow, you're good. 
They're probably still at home watching it rain going, you think it's going to snow? Let's not get out the house. It's cold. It's like, dude. We split the family up. Listen, what I'm about to tell you. Most churches can't do a good census on who, who's coming and what kind of parking they need because everybody in the family drives a vehicle. We're used to, 15 years ago, when we were building churches up in Knoxville and whatever, we'd go through and count the parking spots, and we knew that for every car there was 1.5 or 2.5 people in a car. Now, most of the time, when you look at the vehicles in the parking lot, you go, that's one, because everybody split up. We have, so, we have done such a good job in this culture of splitting up the family that all we have to do is get the mom and dad busy passing each other on the road. She's got that one over there, and he's got this one over there, and then they're going to meet up and swap, and then they're going to go over here, and this one's got this one over here, and this one's going to go over here, and then they're both going to go to work, and then they're going to come back. That Mom and Dad are passing in the daytime in the dark. You know what's going to happen? Listen to me. Set your timer to it. Put your watch on it. Do whatever. You may make it through the teenage years, but once those kids move out, you're going to look at him, or she's going to look at you and go, I don't even know what we have in common. What we did have in common just left the building, and I'm not having anything in common with you, and I'm done with you too. So I don't like to hear that. Brother, you can either hear it and not like it, or you can experience it and have the pain of it. But I'm telling you, it's true. <clears throat> There's times I go home and I go, everybody in the truck! We can't all fit in that, Daddy. Let's take two vehicles. Everybody in here. Well, who's, where? They're riding on your lap. That's not even legal. There's too many rules. Get in. Why? Because I just want to be with you. Really? Yeah. So then we all get in. And everybody puts their headsets on. <laughs> you know what I do? If you don't take those headsets off, I'm going to take the headsets and the phone. And if I can figure out how to kill music and video games, I do that too. But right now, you're going to sit there. You can roll your eyes. You can put your fingers in your ears, but you're going to engage with your mom, your dad, your brothers, and sisters. Because when you walk out of this house, I want you to know that there's two people living in here that love you and love each other. I'm not going to let this stuff drive a wedge in between us, and that's all miss Jesus Christ. I'm done. JT, come on. <sighs> Number three, he's walking. Spend too much time chasing social media or internet. If you've got an iPhone, it'll tell you how much time you spend in front of your screen. That's a shocker. Number four, listen to this word, multitasking. We become distracted by business by multitasking. Multitasking is a great word and a bad word. Business has built up multitasking, and we felt like we had to say we're good multitaskers to get a job. And what most you know, executives or CEOs or whoever, can, can, you, do, can you multitask? I mean, can you do multiple things? Yeah, yeah, I'm a multitasker. Yeah, I can talk and chew gum at the same time. You know what multitasking has caused us to do? It has caused us to do a lot of things good, but nothing really great. You hear me? Last one is, you just think it's going to happen. We get distracted with business. If we just do it long enough and do it hard enough, it'll just happen. We get distracted by it, only to look up and we've wasted our life. Guys, listen to me. I'm not finished. Jesus speaks of an inn where the innkeeper invited somebody in and took care of them. I'm going to talk about it next week. And then Jesus tells a story of a time that he was walking with two people and they stopped at an inn. And just about the time he was about to walk away, they said, would you come in and stay with us? And I want to share with you what we learned. But none of that matters if we're busy and we're distracted. Because Jesus is going to tell you all that stuff, and you're still going to miss it because of the distractions in our life. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Jesus, I love you. I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for your word. Don't allow us to be distracted. I don't know. Maybe some of us are distracted in here. Maybe we're like the innkeeper. Maybe you're trying to do something in our life. You're trying to heal us. You're trying to open up doors. You're trying to fix our families. But we are so busy. And many of us in here are busy doing good stuff. We're doing really good stuff. But the good stuff is what's going to end up killing us. It's going to destroy our relationships. So God, if there be any in here that's just distracted in life, relationships, pain, hurt, self, others, just busy, God, give us the ability to repent of that to turn 
and make the changes necessary in our life so that when you show up to our front porch, we would say, come in and dine with us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.